What about after all this is over? What are you going to do with us? With Aquila? The director of the ministry. The mayor who's been pulling my mother's leash for most of my life. The one who started Mom on this quest to find Aquila and a cure for me. The figure no pony knew anything about apart from my mother and the ponies who lived in this strange place. Even after my mother promised she could help the, get Aquila out of me in this place, I still didn't trust the director. I didn't know what her end goals were or what she wanted with a power like Falling Shadows or Aquila. Was she a friend or a foe? Did she really want to stop Falling Shadows or use it to take over the Wasteland? From what I've heard about the Ministry and their synths replacing ponies, I was sure it was the latter. Director, huh? I said up towards the ceiling. So you're the infamous pony who talked my mom into coming out west to find Falling Shadows and Aquila? Yes, I am, and more. Please don't stand around that small escape room. Head towards the tube and push the call button. The elevator will take you down to the main level where Grimm and your friends are waiting for you, the director said. So I take it you're keeping an eye on me until then? I asked. No, I am only here. I only know you're here because we got a signal that three ponies entered the escape room. That Harry of the Ministry is older and doesn't have a camera system. Normally, the only ponies that can enter that area are our coursers, or the lead engineers. I'd love to find out how you were able to get in that way, since your mother told you to find our synth at the equestrian bank tower, she said. Long story. Maybe I'll tell you once I know I can trust you, I said, heading for the terminal. I assure you, Shadow, that I or my team have no intention of hurting you. We'll see you soon, the director said before cutting off the mic with an audible hissing cackle. Now what? Byte said, looking around the smaller room. And this place isn't exactly what I was expecting from the stories I've heard. I'm sure it's different once we go down. Wingnut said, looking over at me, messing with the terminal. What are you doing, Shadow? Don't worry about me. I just need a minute. I said as I booted up the old terminal and plugged in the other device Mr. Tops gave me. That phrase is reserved for geniuses only. You know next to nothing about computers. Wingnut quipped. <sighs> Whatever. Just shut up and let me do this thing for a sec. I said with a wave of my hoof. It took a moment, but then I saw a loading bar starting up across the screen, followed by a voice echoing out of the terminal. Good job, Shadow. I was wondering how much longer you were going to take to reach the Ministry, Mr. Topps' voice said. Careful. I'm sure they're listening to us right now, I said. He chuckled. No, oh, I've already cut off all communications to this room as soon as you plugged in my ship. Now just wait a moment while the information I need loads. I don't have a lot of time, so please make it snappy, I said as the loading bar worked its way across the screen. Almost done. There we go. Now, once I'm finished taking a talking, pull the chip out and hide it in your saddlebags. All the information I need is on there. I cannot afford to lose that intel, he said. I thought about it for a moment, then said, I might have a better idea. Can you put the intel on my pit buck instead? It'd be a lot safer there than on something that can be taken from me. Not a bad idea. Quick, plug in your pit buck and I'll get started. He said. I did as Wingnut came over, asking, Mr. Tops, why can't you just upload the information right to you? It would take too much time. And it's taking all my concentration doing what I'm doing now with that chip in this place. It's a small bypass program that lets me control the system without them finding me. Also, if I pull the intel to myself and manage to get it all without losing any of it, there's a good chance they'll be able to follow the code back and reverse hack my systems and those of the Lucky Horseshoe. Makes sense, I guess. But why did you need Shadow to get in here? Byte asked. That's my business, child, he said, and then relaxed. Okay, Shadow, 
It's all uploaded to your pip buck on a file named TLH. You can give me the file when you come back to New Pegasus, he said. Now pull that ship out and destroy it. Good luck, and thank you again. No problem, Mr. Tops. See you later, I said, then pulled the chip out of the, and the connection of my pit buck. I dropped the chip on the ground and stomped on it until it was nothing more than powdered splinters. Okay, now that that mission's done, let's go see our friends. Are you sure that was a good idea? How do you know Mr. Tops can be trusted? Wingnut asked. I don't trust him, but he's also been a decent pony, or whatever he is, since I met him. He also paid me for this job, so I'm going to go through with it. Now, let's go, you two, I said, walking over to the lift and hitting the button. A moment later, a metal disc hovered up to the platform, and a glass door opened into a tube. Three of us stepped into it, and without any of us doing anything else, the lift started to go down slowly. For a long moment, we were plunged into the darkness as the lift went through a thick floor we had just been on. Then bright light almost blinded us as we entered a new world. Eyes went wide along with bites and wing nuts as we slowly descended on the ministry. Below us was a large circular courtyard with a large fountain right below the lift platform. Ponies were everywhere, either sitting on a bench below or walking across the yard or talking at the dinner table. Past the large opening area, there were large archways, six in total, with different symbols above each. By each arch, there were ponies in either lab coats, jumpsuits of some kind, or military-looking outfits. I saw newer-looking synths waiting on ponies to order food or buy something at small shops. There were ponies in dark trench coats with sunglasses on all over the place near one of the archways. I saw what looked like dogs, normal dogs, playing with foals, nice clothes being sold, and up the walls were... Balconies and older ponies, relaxing in the artificial sunlight streaming down from overhead. To top it off, every pony was clean and happy and well-fed. There was something like paradise still in Equestria. It was here. The lift was reaching the bottom when I finally saw them. Aura, Mom, Windthrasher, Stardust, Solstice, and Orticalus. All waiting for us at the bottom of the ramp. As soon as the door to the glass elevator opened... Aura and Stardust both ran towards me, pulling me into a three-way hug. I gasped for air in a squeaky voice. Too tight. Too tight. <laughs> we're so glad you finally made it. We were worried sick about you, Stardust said, not letting me go. I'm glad the plan worked, and you found these two. It was a risk leaving them behind, but it worked, Aura said from the other side of me. Okay, you two. Don't suffocate her. Mom said. A moment later, they both let me go. Mom smiled as she looked at me, saying, Good to see you made it here in one place, though I'm surprised you came through this way. We found our own way here, Bite said as she pushed past me, her eyes taking in everything around us. This place can't be real. Did we die when we tried to use that teleporter thing? It's like we walked into the past. I've never seen anything this clean before, Wingnut added as he pushed past me to stand next to Bite. I assure you it's quite real. We are very far underground right now. This is the Ministry, and the Director wants to meet you three before we continue with our little project, Mom said. Oh, hold up a sec, I said as I followed her down the ramp, kissing her quickly before I did so. First of all, why in the goddess's name was I left on the beach of death? Second, why the hell did you leave two foals alone in that city? That was my idea, shrimp. Plus, they're hardly foals anymore, Aura said sheepishly. We were attacked by steel rangers. They have guns on most of the tall buildings around La Salicorn. We couldn't risk having you die while you were sleeping, so we needed to put you down somewhere safe. And then, had the kids dropped off in another safe place so they could go find you while we tried to draw their attention away. That has to be the stupidest plan I've ever heard, I said, looking at her in shock. Well, it worked, didn't it? Solstice said. And she's not telling the whole truth. We were going to send one of us to wait for you, but we didn't have time. She didn't drop you off. She kicked you out of the door when we flew low over the sand. 
I'm surprised you didn't break anything. I said a few minutes later that we should send someone back to get you up once you had woken up. Well, that explains the pain I was in when I woke up. <clears throat> so you sent the kids? Not exactly, Byte said. At first they were going to send Ori Callus, but Grimm said it would be a bad idea. I guess they have ponies who know how to stop him in the city. Then we were going to send Solstice, but since she's Enclave, technically, she'd risk being killed slowly if they caught her. And they kept on arguing over and over about who should go once we reached a safe spot. So Wingnut and I just got out of the Sky Carriage after hearing Aura's plan and ran. Wait, he told me Aura sent you, I yelled. She did, just not of her own free will, Wingnut said. I did manage to get a message to them a few minutes later, after using Grimm's pip buck to broadcast to Bites. I would have gone after them, but we fell under attack again, Aura said. And you just decided to come wait here for me? I asked, looking at them dumbfounded. Aurichalus finally spoke up, saying, It was the only safe place after the sky carriage blew up. Oh yes, I forgot about that part. Darda said, scratching the back of his head, looking sheepish. You blew up our sky carriage, I yelled. No, Mom said. The rangers clipped the magical generator and it started getting unstable. It would have blown up with us in it or out of it. So we flew as close to a ministry entry point as we could and, well, jumped out. Ora took me to the ground. Orichalus didn't need help since he has no body, and the rest of us are flyers. Windthrasher, who looked sicker than she did when I last saw her, added, Then we landed by some building. Your mom did something to the wall, and there was a flash of light, and we were here. End of story. Now we... Can we get on with all this? I'm not feeling well. I want to lie down. Fine, but how are we going to get back home? I asked. It's not like sky carriages are easy to find. We'll figure something out, Aura said. For now, I'm just glad you're safe. The place is pretty cool once you get used to it. They have this food printer thingy that'll make anything. It's like that one space show ponies watched a long time ago. I hung my head and looked at all of them. Fine, let's get this meeting over with and finish up with the bitch in my head once and for all. Aura smiled. It was strange to see her as a pony, but I managed to smile back as she pulled me close and hugged me. Just wait till you see what Grimm's put together. I think we have a fighting chance now. Oh, and you'll like the director. She's interesting. Yes, she is. And very smart. Mom said as she started to lead the way as we went away from the onlooking ponies of the Ministry. First, though, my friend is going to have a look at you three to make sure you're okay and free of any radiation. That's one thing the Ministry does whenever it can to keep out of this place. Oh, and you'll also be getting a shower, and I'll have one of the synths look at that armor and barding of yours. No way. No pony is touching Shadow's armor but me. I've done a lot of modifications to that armor, and I'm not letting some robot mess it all up. Wingnut said stopping his hoof as he followed. Fine. Then I'll have some tools brought over to the suite we'll be staying in while we're here. Even if Beta is a master of all tools, Mom said. Now, where the hell did she get off to? I told her I wanted her close in case you showed up. Who are you talking about, Mom? I asked, looking around as we passed over the overly clean ponies of the Ministry and their synths. Is it the director? No, dear, it's my best. Mom started, but was interrupted by a voice from my past. A voice that shouldn't even be able to speak, because I'd cut her throat in the Tower of Winapolis. Grimoire, there you are. I've been looking all over for you, and you know how annoyed I get when I have to walk around searching down some pony. I'm a very busy pony, and I don't have time to babysit your brain-damaged ass. The voice of Dr. Stormy said from down the ramp just in front of us. I looked up in shock, and a moment later pulled Dreamwalker out of its holster and pointed it up at the older 
look alike of myself. Only with a grayer mane and dark orange eyes. I stopped where I was as I sighted on her head. How the hell are you still alive? She looked at me, confused. Her eyes meeting mine when she said in that same bored voice I remembered when I said I would blow her brains out with a pistol. Why does every pony in the wasteland have to be such a drama queen? Who are you, anyway? You're annoying, and if you don't have to be here, don't be. Shadow, put it down, Stardust said, trying to take Dreamwalker. No, Stardust. That bitch should be dead. I cut her throat in Mill City Tower before I blew it up. She's the mayor who started the Devil's Child program. She's the one who made you into what you are. I yelled. I know. She told me all about it. Wait, what do you mean you killed her? I knew about the whole program, which, if you listen to her, you'll understand how far that went from her original plan. But she can't be the mayor you killed. He said. Stormy interrupted us. So, you're the little twerp who broke my body double then, huh? I was wondering about that. I couldn't get the data back from that day because of what you did to the tower. That was very rude of you. I hope you know. Do you know how much time goes into making a synth of her caliber? I narrowed my eyes at her. So, you expect me to believe that thing I killed wasn't you, but a robot? Stormy rolled her eyes. I do so hate it when ponies call them robots. The Generation 3 synths are far more sophisticated than a normal robot. They're 99.5% match to a real pony. Everything within them is organic tech, down to the very blood they have running through their bodies. Apart from a small chip in their heads, and some very small details, but you can't tell the difference between a real pony and a synthetic one. Lies went wide at that. You mean you're making robotic clones? If you want to put it in idiotic terms, then sure. I'm making robo-clones. It's a lot faster and much cheaper way of cloning. Stormy said, looking over at Grimm. I thought you said that the courier was smart. Psh. No one says that. I heard Bite snicker behind me. She is smart, Stormy, but not with stuff like this. Mom said, looking annoyed. Stormy looked back at me. And you say she's your daughter, too? The one you told me died? I am her daughter. She's just got brain damage from overuse of her zebra spells. I said in a huff. Aura snickered at that as Mom face-hoofed. Stormy just shrugged. I told her before that overusing those spells would be a bad idea. But she never listens to me. If she had, she wouldn't have married Night Nightshade. Still, I guess you do look like the little filly I met many years ago. Just different colors, mane and coat, but those eyes are hard to mistake for another's. Interesting. I guess you get your smarts from your father's side. All guns, bombs, and glory. No care in the world of books and proper learning. Live fast, die young, go out with a bang. Hey, don't talk to her like that, Nora yelled. She's plenty book smart. I face hoofed to my mind. Thanks, Aura, but I know I'm not. Oh well, at least she's defending me. Stormy looked at her and laughed. Well, at least she has good taste in mares. Too bad I didn't meet you a few years ago. You would have been such a fun toy. Aura visibly shivered. Hey, I'm not a pony, I'm a griffin. I've told you that like three times now. Stormy grinned. You look like a mare right now, and that's all I care about. Plus, you came from the wasteland, so chances are you're just crazy. I met a stallion once who thought he was a ghoul. Can you imagine that? She said, then turned back to face the rest of us. Well, anyway, welcome to the Ministry. My name is Dr. Stormy, Head of Research, and the third seat in the Council. You three need to come with me so I can have our doctor get you cleaned up and make sure you're not bringing in anything that we don't want in the ministry. Once that's all over, you'll be coming to the council chambers to meet with the director herself. Be mindful of the delousing powder. It stings like a bitch. Yeah, this was definitely the same stormy I'd seen in Mom's memory orbs. 
Still couldn't wrap my head around the fact that a simp, what I killed in the tower, not the real one. She seemed so real when I cut her throat. I could see now why the Steel Rangers and the ponies who knew about the Ministry were so scared of them. They could replace ponies in the wasteland with perfect copies. Well, I was here now. Can't do much until Mom is finished getting rid of Quilla. So I started by following along with my friends. As we walked through the arch towards the one with the large red cross on it, Wingnut asked, So if you want to keep this place clean, then why are you having us follow you through the main chamber? Stormy laughed. Smart cold. Well, to answer your question, it's because I have a spell over you three, keeping anything around you from escaping within a few centimeters of your body. It's like being in a plastic bubble you won't horribly suffocate in. You cast a spell on us? Bite asked, looking at her hooves like she would see a shimmering aura around herself. Of course I did, as soon as you arrived upstairs, Stormy said as she led us up some steps. You cast a spell from that far away? I asked a nod. I've been doing that kind of long-distance spell work for most of my life. It's not that hard anymore, Stormy said. Oricalus came up next to me, saying, Stormy was one of the top unicorns in her class in the Crystal Empire. She was a grade above your mother. She also finished her secondary schooling in one year, something that normally takes three. She's got four doctorates in microbiology, robotic engineering, magical manipulation, and cyber hacking and programming. She has an IQ of 210. She's one of the smartest mayors in all the Enclave, and even here at the Ministry, I'd bet. Ah, Ori, you flatter me as always, but I still won't sleep with you, so stop trying, dear. Stormy said, followed by a loud laugh. She's also a pervert, Mom said with a smile. I heard that, Grim. Don't make me tie you to my bed later, Stormy replied as we reached the doors. You just proved my point, Mom said, rolling her eyes. And I thought I was bad, I said as my friends came close looking at the large doors. Okay, Shadow. This isn't so bad. The doctor's a good dude, and he likes to play pranks, so don't let him get to you, okay? Stardust said with a kind smile. Are we getting shots? Bite asked, looking scared. Well, yes, of course you are. A slim older stallion said as he came out of the door. He had a honey-colored coat with pale blue eyes and a mane. He smiled at the folds. But not too many. Normally it takes me six, maybe seven, to get your system flushed. Bite's eyes went wide. I, I'll go wait outside. I don't want a shot. Sorry, dear, but you can't leave. No pony can, with the director saying so. So buck up and get over yourself. Stormy said with a large smile. Dr. Elm, this is Grimm's daughter Shadow and her two wards. Um... Weiner and Light. It's Wingnut and Bite, Wingnut said as Bite shook like a leaf, her voice seeming to escape her. Isn't that what I said? Stormy asked, looking back at me. Whatever. Anyway, they need to be cleared of anything toxic, and the director wants it done yesterday, so we don't have a lot of time. No problem, Stormy. I'm ready for them, and we've cleared the clinic up for a couple of hours. He said, looking over at us. All right, jokes aside, this will take a bit of time. But there will only be one shot, I promise. And you won't feel it much, so you can calm down, little filly. Now if you'd all follow me, we can get this started. I looked over at Mom and then Nora. This is all happening so fast. Nora kissed me, ignoring the giggles from Stormy, and said, You'll be fine. You'll be waiting for you out there. Just relax a little and try not to shoot any pony. You're letting me keep my weapons? I asked, just noticing then that I was still holding Dreamwalker and holstered it. Stormy shrugged. You can keep them as long as you don't go around trying to shoot up any pony. If you try that, the coursers will turn you into a dust faster than you can blink. Now, let's go. I took in a deep breath and walked into the clinic. My eyes fell on a shocking room of White walls, white chairs, silver tables and tools, and a black desk in the corner. It was like color was a sin here. 
It was so shocking to my eyes that I had to squint as I walked. Bite and Wingnut were close behind. Dr. Elm closed the door behind us and walked over the desk. Each one of you pick a bed in the clinic and wait for me there. I just need to enter your information into the computer and we can begin, he said, typing something up on his terminal. It was an odd-looking terminal with a flat screen and a cord going into a small box the size of my hoof. What's that? I've never seen a terminal like it before, I asked. Ah, huh. I guess you wouldn't have seen a newer model computer in the wasteland, huh? This is the latest ministry design, based off of some of the Carrot Company designs. They're a lot faster than terminals and have a lot more power than what you're used to. They are also hack-proof. They've been modifying them over the years to be even better, he said with, as he finished. Nothing's hack-proof, I said with a grin. This terminal is, he said, stepping away from the desk. Some of our best hackers have tried and still no pony's gotten into it, he said with a chuckle. Heh, <laughs> bet you a hundred caps that I can, maybe with the help of Byte, I said with a bigger grin. Huh. <laughs> If you can break into this terminal, I'd give you more than those bottle caps you call currency. I'd let you have my prized weapon. It's the prize I've offered any pony that thinks they can crack this computer, he said. Fight smiled before looking back at the doctor. Do you ministry ponies have high-yield magical energy crystals here? The question took him by surprise. Yes, of course we do. It's something we need for our work with the synths. Throw in five of those, the weapon, and five hundred caps, and I'll do it, he said. Don't you want my help? I asked, wiggling my Mark II at her. She rolled her eyes and wiggled hers right back at me. Trust me, Shadow. Mine's got better software than yours. Mine belonged to Apple Bloom herself. Mine's the Firk Mars too, you know. You stupid bug. I almost called her out for using that bug word again, but thought better of it. She was a capable filly and loved to show off and one-up others. So, what's the harm in trying? The doctor looked between the two of us and shrugged. Fine, deal. But after we're finished. Awesome, Byte said. Now I have something to look forward to. Dr. Elm just shook his head and pulled over a tray with three needles on it. You'll fail just like the rest. Have fun trying. Now, let's get started.